Paul we read now from Colossians and chapter 2 and from the sixth verse. So then, just as you have received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority, in who in him you were also circumcised, in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and in your uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a, a religious festival, a new moon, celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are the shadow of things that were, were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the prize. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen, and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with great no and idle notions. He has lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body support and compel together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you have still belonged to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, with their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. But they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. During the days of the early church, there were great efforts made by Jews in particular, to try to bring new Christians under the old principles of the law. If you were a Jew and you became a Christian, you were expected by many Jews to still follow the old traditions and obey them, such as circumcision and all the other indulgences that went with it. If you were a Gentile, that is a non-Jew, when you became a Christian, they were really asking that newborn Christian, that non-Jew, to become circumcised and become a Jew before they could really be a Christian. And this principle was really making Paul angry. And I want to take us a text this morning. It's sometimes good to have a text because the old way when I was taught to preach was this. If you give a text, when the service is open, people have gone away, they might forget what you've said. But I should remember the text. So I'll give you a text in case you forget what I say. Galatians 5 verse 1 says this. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free and do not be entangled with the yoke of bondage again. Stand fast in the liberty 
wherewith Christ has made you free. <clears throat> we sang earlier, I am no longer a slave. I am a child of God. And that applies to all of you and me if we are truly born again of the Spirit. We're no longer slaves. We are free. We are children of God. It's a principle, a very basic one, that we need to hold on to. We belong to God's family. The old ways are finished and gone. And as Paul says it when he writes his second letter to Corinthians, he says, if any man be Christ, he is a new creation. The old things are finished and gone, and behold, all things have become new. And I trust for, for you this morning that all things are new for you in Christ. Every day brings something new. And old Kim used to put it this way, new every morning is the love. New every morning is the love. Our wakening on and our rising proof, through sleep and darkness safely brought, restored to life and power and form. It tells us every day to be new, not only in our flesh, but also in our spirit. Every day, and we must not get entangled with the old ways that cannot drag us down. Now, I'm not suggesting to you this morning that you're going to suddenly go back to old Jewish principles and you've got a solid Jewish law. Paul has dealt with that, and the church has dealt with that over the years, but there are many other things that can still bind you and drag you down and spoil your Christian experience. And when Paul sees this happening to the church in his day, it hurt. And it hurt so much it made him angry. And really, the Paul passage to the Galatians is an angry Paul writing to them. He wants them for goodness sake to put the old ways away. Stop it. Move forward with God. That's the principle he wants to undertake. And that's the principle we should be undertaking now. Right at the beginning of that passage I read to you, it says this. So then, as you receive Christ as Lord, continue to live in him. As you receive him, live in him. Rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. Tremendous verse, that. So you have received Christ and to live in him. We need to get our roots down. It's wonderful to sing, it's wonderful to praise God in, in voice, but also we need to praise God in depth. What I mean by that is that our lives should be deep in the Word of God and in prayer and in fellowship with Him because that's the way to grow. Praise is praise, not only in song, but in study of His Word and in prayer and in the daily life we live. It is a continual praise. It isn't something we just do at church, it's something that is our life. In praising God is a basic principle of Christian life in Him. In Romans 12, in the second verse, Paul says this, that we are not to be conformed to the principles of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, don't fall back on the old ways of your life. You've been transformed, stay transformed by daily renewing your mind in the Spirit and the Word of God. You know, we don't need religion. We need life. We don't need religion. We need life. I mean, I suppose you've been asked, I'll probably have a numerous occasions. Are you, are you religious? Well, they come to you and say, well, you know, he's a religious person. Well, I suppose in principle we are religious. That's what the word means. But it sounds pious to me. It sounds a bit stodgy. We're not just living a, a religion. We have a new life. And that's what we need to rejoice in and not allow ourselves to be dragged back in the old ways. One other thing I would say in that context is this, that it's important that we don't leave God out. And that might sound very basic and rather strange thing to say, but it's surprising how often in life we, we do leave God out. 
you know, a, a country which we used to be renowned as a Christian country now leaves God out. It leaves God out of its politics. It leaves God out of its education. You know, it even leaves God out of our health. Every aspect of our life, God has been left out. And people wonder why our country is in the state it is. Why there is no trust. We can't trust politicians. We can't trust doctors. We can't trust this one. Things are, you know, it's even in religion. In other words, it's in the church as well. And I'm afraid it is. It can be. We leave God out, and therefore corruption gets in every aspect of our life. I was once spoken to a policeman <coughs> coming in the cave and uh, with some friends, and somebody suddenly turned to him and said, Do you go to church? And he said, No. He said, oh, I don't go to church. He said, I, I'm not a Christian. He said, he said, I'm, I'm in the police. He said, if you see some things I see, he said, you'd understand why I'm not a Christian. And I popped in, I was a little rather rude really, and I said, well, I said, you're a policeman. I said, but have you ever heard of a, <coughs> uh, a bent copper? Well, he says, of course I have, but yeah, but I said, you're still a policeman. Corruption is everywhere. It's even, even in your health. It's even in the NHS. How is it there? Fancy going to your doctor one day and sitting on the other side of the desk with Mr. Dr. Shipman. Yes, I'm starved. But corruption is everywhere. But don't leave our God out of our life. Because when we leave God out, corruption comes in. And corruption destroys the work of the Spirit. And when the work of the Spirit is destroyed, we backslide, we fall back into the old ways again. You know, when you became a Christian, do you know you lost a close friend? You did. When you became a Christian, you lost a close friend. His name is Satan, the Elsie book. You lost him, but he wants you back again. And you say, well, he's never going to get me. But Paul also warns us of this, he that thinks he stands, let him beware, lest he fall. You know, we can have confidence in our own self, rather than confidence in God. And these are warning principles that Paul is exercising in this letter to Colossians. When you were dead in your sins and the circumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all our sins with its written code and regulations that was against us and stood opposed us. He took them all away and nailed them to the cross. The old wise don't need to apply anymore. He's taken, he's dealt with. Maybe even in your heart you still carry guilt of your past life. Let Christ nail it to the cross. You don't need to have guilt. Christ has dealt with it, is forgiven, and you are new in him. All the many years I had the, the great joy of leading people to Christ. I became a, a full-time evangelist. I not turned perhaps a bloody ground like that, but my calling in evangelism was to travel around the country and, and do work in little small churches, and struggling churches. And, conduct missions there. And all the years, about three years of this, I had the joy of many, leading many to Christ. It's a wonderful thing when it happens. And uh, I suppose for a preacher, it's probably one of the greatest things that happens. And I say one of the greatest things. A little letter in the Bible, and I don't suppose hardly anybody ever turns and reads, is the second letter of John, or the third letter of John. The third letter of John, I think is very special, because it's written to a friend of, him, of Paul's called Gaius, who he says, I love in truth. Now Paul obviously led Gaius to faith in Christ. Just listen to these words. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health, and all that may go well with you 
even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy to have some brethren come and tell me about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in truth. I have no greater joy than to hear my children walk in truth. If there's one thing that's greater than winning a soul for Christ, it is to know that they walk on with God. Can I just tell you a brief little story? I was conducting a mission in a church in the Peak District of Derbyshire. Most of those chapels are very small and most of them are Methodist churches, which this one was. And I remember at the end of this meeting I made an appeal for anybody to come to Christ. And there was just silence. Nothing really happened. And just as I was con concluding the appeal and didn't go on to the closure of the service, a little girl got up. I estimated her at about 10 or 12 years of age and she came forward to the front and she knelt down to the front and just quietly knelt there and speaking to her afterwards with one or two others of the church she simply came and said I just wanted to give my life to Jesus so I like statement but I thought it's a statement of faith that we've all made I thought this morning I want to give my life to Jesus. I remember a lady, she said, was Doreen Smith. Nothing spectacular in a name like that, is it? But I want to tell you this, that some, must be 15 years later, maybe a little bit more, I was also in the Pig District, but at another church. And uh, we had a youth rally there, and I'd gone to speak about that weekend. And one of the leaders, of the youth group in that circuit of churches, she was leading the service and uh, so forth. But I didn't know her. Young lady, I think both in mid 20s, something like that, very attractive. And uh, after the service was over, I just chatted with her. And she said, You don't remember me, do you? I said, No. She says, My name is Doreen Smith. My heart welled up within me. Here she was, going on with God. How wonderful it was. That's the good aspect of it, isn't it? To see people go on with God. But the sad time sometimes is when we see people who have fallen away from God. And that saddens the heart of those who love the Lord and love to see a child of God growing in faith. It can happen. Sad to say, it does happen. But there's no greater joy than to see people go on growing Christ throughout their lives, whatever time that is. So therefore, Paul says, stand fast now in the liberty, freedom that God has given you in Christ. And don't be entangled again with the old ways. Don't fall back. In conclusion, let me just tell you another little story. My mother and father, but my mother especially, kept budget yards. <clears throat> not one, not two, but around the room, four or five cages at a time. Budget yards, chirping, whale, day in, day out, budget yards. And when I was a small boy, I didn't like the idea. I didn't like the idea of seeing a bird in a cage. And I used to protest fervently to my mother. Why do you do it? Set them free and open the door, let them out. And she used to say, if I let them out, they wouldn't survive. If I let them out, I never really believed her. But she compromised on one occasion, and what she did, she closed the windows, but what she did, she opened the cages of the birds and let them fly around the room. It's all right when there's one bird, but when there's a six or seven birds. So. Well, I was, to my amazement, this was that. You know, they fly around the room, settle somewhere, and go back in the cage again. I couldn't make that out. One day when she did this, she forgot herself and she left the window open. And one of the budget guards, her horror, flew out of the window. And of course, you know what she did. She turned to me, I told you so. I told you so. Don't listen to me. Don't, you don't know what's that. And what happened? Two minutes later, 
The bird flew back through the window. Beeline for the door and the cage and flew inside and sat on its perch. The bird didn't want to be free. It wouldn't be free. It's against its nature to be free. And I only tell you this because as silly as it may be, sometimes we can be like that. We still long for the, the past, the things of the world that attract us. And they poke at us from every angle. But the thing is, they try to bring us back into captivity again, back into the cage. That's the way you belong, the inner voice says. You know, the things of the world are good, things of the world are a pleasure, they're a temptation. But they're a bondage and they bring us back. And this kind of thing was happening to the people of Colossae and Galatia. And Paul was angry about that. Thus he says, that text this morning, which I leave you with, it's now stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. And do not be entangled with the yoke of bondage again. Amen. Amen.